data Hadoop works and the HDFS architecture, which is going to be our focus today. Right? So we're going to understand how HDFS works with respect to big data. First of all, uh, let us go through the agenda that we have for today. First is structured. Now, this is the most familiar sort of data for people in the data analytics slash data science slash uh, database management domains. Structured data is essentially uh, data which is present in tables, SQL tables uh, to be more precise. So these uh, data sets essentially have column names associated to them and they have roles, right? So uh, there, there can be a primary key, there may not be a primary key, but it, it is essentially a data which is absolutely well structured it, it can be accessed uh, mathematical operations can be performed on it uh, you can uh, calculate possibilities probabilities in fact uh, in a lot of supervised machine learning algorithms this is the data that you need to have for those algorithms to run right the second sort of data that we have is a, a mismatch of uh, completely random information and structure right in this particular uh, data set what you have is not sql tables you have files which contain a certain amount of text in them so this text could be in a particular format now that format is custom and that could vary essentially but it does have a structure to it for instance there is csv files csv is short for comma separated values so whenever you are creating a text file and you're separating all of the data records with a comma right Although uh, it doesn't seem to be of structure, it could still be a text file, but it does have structure when you delimit all of the data values with a comma and put it into an algorithm. Some structure can be obtained from it, and this particular data set can be converted into a structured data set, which means it could be converted into an SQL table. So that is what semi-structured data is. So data with a certain amount of structure, but not exactly an SQL table. And lastly is the data that is unstructured data, right? So this data does not have an order to it. So what will happen is you put this data into an algorithm that can derive some order out of it if any order is possible at all. So this could be JPG, MP3, uh, MP4, all of those sorts of data sets uh, are structured uh, data sets, unstructured data sets, essentially. So now that we know what data is, uh, what if we boost that data? What if we amplify the amount of data, the speed of data, right? Uh, the, the amount of data that you currently have. So when you significantly increase that amount of data, it becomes big data. But it's not that simple of an explanation. There are some criteria that have to be satisfied for data to be termed as big data. So these are called the five V's of big data, if you say. Uh, the first V would be the velocity. Now, velocity means speed, and that means that the data that is coming into your server or your storage location should come at a very rapid rate. So the data is inaccurate, the data must have missing values in it, or the data must have incorrect values in it. So that is veracity. Practical application, you will not get perfect data. So veracity is also a criteria that needs to be satisfied for data to be termed as big data. Then you have value. So whatever data that you are extracting or getting should not be random gibberish, right? So it cannot be of no sense at all. Say for instance, you are analyzing academic data and in that case, uh, the roll number of a particular academic student may not matter uh, as much as their grades, uh, as much as their academic performance, right? So even if you take the roll number column of, of that student, you cannot actually create any sort of data analytics or data science model out of it, right? So the data of the roll number is not of value. So the data should always be of value as well. So I hope that clarifies what the five Bs of big data are to you. So heading on over to is we need appropriate storage for that big data to be stored. So right off the bat, we have the problem of storage. You cannot store big data on your computer. You hardly have one terabyte of computer, uh, one terabyte of hard drive space in the computers that you get today, uh, let alone uh, storing petabytes of data on a laptop. Forget about it. You can't do that. So it's very hard to store. So there needs to be a solution for that. And secondly, even if you are able to store that much data with 
the one processor that you have in your laptop it is very hard to process as well so say if you run an algorithm on that data and you have a four core processor you can forget about analyzing petabytes of data uh, without you know passing in a year or months for to say the least to process that data right you need to have a proper architecture to deal with this problem so these are the two major problems that are there with big data and with hadoop essentially uh, when when hadoop was launched and hadoop came up with the hdfs the big data storage problem was solved so how was it solved we'll get into that in a bit basically we need to understand what hdfs is hdfs is an abbreviation for the hadoop distributed file system which means hdfs is a file system designed for storing very large files with streaming data access patterns running on clusters of commodity hardware so very uh, tricky words that were just used we'll go through this point by point this means that uh, hadoop first of all hdfs is an implement to solve the big data crisis by combining a lot of computers together right so commodity hardware means something that is not expensive something that comes in your use in day to day life but it still solves the problem of big data you might be thinking okay uh, how is my uh, laptop with such low requirements uh, useful for storing big data your laptop alone is not uh, the appropriate answer to store big data but your laptop combined with a lot of other laptops like that right in together in a network is a solution for storing big data so imagine if you dedicate a particular percentage of your hard drive to storing big data while you're working in an organization you all have workstations you dedicate a particular percentage of your hard drive to storing the big data in your organization so all of those combined together on a local area network for instance with almost uh, negligible latency because you are all so close uh you can store big data in in that environment by installing hadoop onto your system and implementing hdfs so that is how you solve the problem of storing big data so one of the things that it does it stores very large files because you're dividing the file into multiple sections and storing it across uh, all on all of the nodes right so that is the problem that you solve with that secondly there is streaming data access so each analysis of the data set involves a large portion of the data set right so the time to read the whole data set is more important than the latency in reading the first uh, record essentially so this essentially means that uh, whenever from somebody is trying to access this big data cluster uh, from a remote location even if he's far off the latency does not exactly matter because uh, at the end of the day even if you have a 200 millisecond of latency which means the time it takes for the client to connect to the hdfs server you still can give instructions and the data would be processed in the given time right the data would be processed uh, for as long as it needs to be processed and the time is significantly reduced uh, when you're using hdfs in your processing architecture right so this is the advantage of hdfs and sec thirdly you have commodity hardware which means cheap hardware which means you don't have to buy uh, dedicated servers to store your big data you can use normal commodity hardware which are cheap to come by you can connect them all together you can create your own big data cluster let's go to the architecture uh, and the working of the hdfs firstly let us understand the architecture the architecture consists of uh, primarily two elements the two elements are the name node and the data node right so the name node is the node that contains all of the metadata which means the data of that data the introduction uh, the starting point and the end point of the data so essentially what will happen is uh, the client will write a file and the client will read a file right so whenever the client writes a file onto the hdfs the name node stores uh, on which particular data node the the starting part of that file is and on which particular data node the end part of that file is and on which particular data node the middle part of that file is so there are a lot of nodes that come under the data node uh, the name node and the name node controls and coordinates all of these data nodes uh, together so the name node could be a commodity hardware that is not that uh, uh, high on spe specs essentially which means that it does not have a lot of storage space it does not have a good processor but the name node can simply act as a controller of the data nodes which are significantly or comparatively higher in specifications right 
So let us understand how uh, the process works. So if you're trying to write a file uh, onto the HDFS, the client will request to create a file, right? And that information will be sent to the name node. And then name node uh, basically is contacted once the upload has uh, accumulated to the point where a block size has been reached. So the block size is essentially uh, the threshold set in the HDFS, which means that if the file is above this particular size, you will divide it into parts, right? So you will divide it into parts of the block size. Basically, take the entire file size and divide it by the block size that is set in your HDFS. And it will be the file will be divided into those many blocks, right? So the name node responds with a list of data nodes that are available and free to store this file. The data node receives uh, uh, data from the HDFS clients and it writes to the local uh, space that they have. The data nodes write the file parts, the blocks to the space that they have. Right? The data node forwards the file to the second data node for replication and then to a third. So this is a very essential part and one of the most interesting factors of the HDFS. So say you have uh, file blocks, right? You have divided your files into blocks. The other thing that HDFS solves, say one of these data nodes fails, right? So what happens to that first block of your file? Say if your file has been divided into three blocks and one of the data nodes fail, do you lose the first block and you only have uh, two thirds of the file? No. Uh, what the HDFS does for you is it replicates all of these files across all of these data nodes, right? So it's replicated as well. So when one of the data node fails, you still have the backup of that file and you can still read that file because you still have it intact even if the one data node fails, right? So that is uh, one of the key factors, data replication. It is replicated and then the name node commits the file creation into a persistent store. It uh, receives heartbeat and block reports. So the name node is constantly checking which data nodes are healthy and which are not. So if one is unhealthy, the data node will not try to access the files from there. If somebody tries to read it, it will access the file from some other data node and it will not use that data node for file storage as well. And the client gets the data node list from the data node. It reads from the replica closest to the render. So the other thing that happens is uh, you also want to reduce the latency at which you read the file. So wherever the client is closest, right, whichever data node the client is closest to, he'll read that particular block of that file from that data node itself to minimize any delay uh, in reading that file. So let us understand all of this with a demo. So let us get to the hands-on section where I'll show you how you store a file in the HDFS. So currently I have my CentOS 6.3 virtual machine open. Now this has uh, Hadoop installed in it. And this is the virtual machine that you would get uh, if you apply for any of the courses at in Telepath. So firstly, uh, I'll open up uh, my home directory. Right, so I have uh, some files over here. So say uh, if I wanted to uh, import this particular file, which is the weatherhistory.csv file to my HDFS because it was a big file, right? It might not be a big, big file right now, but uh, I'll just show you the procedure of how we would actually put it into the HDFS and how simple all of it is, right? So uh, as I told you earlier on, HDFS is a combination of uh, nodes uh, combined. All of the all of them are combined together and they basically are part of a network, right? So whenever you try to upload a file on the HDFS, it automatically gets divided into uh, blocks of, of the designated block size of your HDFS and then uh, it is spread across uh, all of the nodes in that particular uh, big data or Hadoop cluster, right? So when that happens, uh, it basically is split up in various sections, but when you try to access it, you'll see it as one file, and one file only. So I'll show you how that works. So for now, let us open a terminal. First thing we have to do is open up a terminal. So uh, currently I have a terminal open. I'll just expand the text so you guys can see as well. That is enough, right? So firstly, I'll just bring that window up again and I'll type in the commands. So first thing that we need to do is we need to create a directory uh, to store that file in. So uh, it is simple. 
similar to how you would do it uh, in your normal file directory you would do it in the hdfs as well so you will type in hadoop fs hyphen and then mkdir so mkdir is short for make directory in linux when you write that uh, you can simply type in something like uh, new folder right so uh, imagine that uh, we are creating a folder within our hdfs our hadoop distributed file system we do that so our folder has now been created right so the next thing we would do is we will look at the file name that we want to transfer so in this case it's weather with a cap uh, with a small w and a capital h uh, history dot csv so we want to transfer that into our hdfs it's simple uh, since in linux your present working directory would always be your home directory so we will type in hadoop fs and then a hadoop command which is put so what put does is the first argument in put is the uh, file directory on your local file system and the second argument is the file directory on the hadoop file system i'll type in weather history dot csv which is the file we want to copy and the second would be the new folder that we just created so once i uh, enter that and i bring this window over here and i press enter Take some time but it transfers the file uh, into that particular folder so if we can simply type in hadoop fs hyphen ls which is another linux command but you can use it in the hdfs as well and then type in the new folder name that we just created press enter and we can see that in the new folder there is a weather history.csv that is how hadoop works in storage essentially And that brings us to the end of our little demonstration here today, guys. Uh, this was just to give you an idea of how the HDFS works and how big data storage works, right? So if you're interested in this particular course, if you're interested in big data in general, uh, we have courses for big data, uh, very specific to your needs. It may be you can contact our course advisors. Uh, they'll assist you in finding the perfect course for your particular needs, for your particular job requirements, right? So these are the contact details presented on your screen here today. Uh, you can contact the sales team using sales at intellipath.com. You can chat with our course advisors so that they can guide you. They are available 24-7. Uh, and be sure that you sign up for our webinars because we discuss uh, technologies like these uh, almost every day. So be sure you keep up with us uh, by signing up with our webinar and attending our webinars and asking your doubts first first and foremost from our course advisors, from our trainers. Uh, with regards to these technologies, you can ask your doubts one-on-one. -on -one. When you're uh, attending our webinars, you can ask for questions and the trainers and course advisors will uh, answer your doubts. So the webinar link registration is in the YouTube chat box. You may sign up for it for the next webinar, whatever we have. So that is about it from Intellipath. Thank you for attending this particular session and goodbye.